Peace of Christ be with you. Hey, let's give a little love to Mike and Luke up here for the improvisation. Nice. Well done. Well, it's right before Thanksgiving, and I got a letter from my friend Karis this week. For those of you who don't know or are visiting, I have a friend from graduate school in the University of St. Andrews named Karis, and she's the dean of the chapel at Despondent University in upstate Washington in Wantmore County, and we have this letter exchange. And so she just sent me a letter, and I thought it fit this time of year, so I'll read it to you with your permission. Dear Trigvi, thank you for your last letter dated November 6th. The pictures you sent have made it to my refrigerator. My favorite is of little Trigby climbing the bookshelf naked. (laughs) I'm sure it's a sign of literary prowess. I'm sure years from now your son will appreciate how you have exploited his childhood for your own amusement. I'm sure his counselor will enjoy it as well. (laughs) Nevertheless, little T looks like a gamer and he must bring you and Kristen great joy. And he does. I'm writing this letter to you, sipping the famous cornucopia latte at a small table at Life's Hard Cafe, where the motto is, life's hard, have a cup of coffee. The ambient mood of Rice Boy Sleeps is creating a reflective atmosphere in the mostly empty cafe. Typically, the cafe is packed with students this time of day, making it nearly impossible to get a table. Yet as I look around, the only people around me are a few moms clicking away on laptops with kids in strollers and a handful of diehard regulars playing chess. The fact that most of the seats around me are unoccupied, it's a sure sign that Thanksgiving break is upon us. That and the rise of the albano squirrels, slow and fat from a fall of binge eating, are being flattened one by one by unswerving students hurrying home for the holidays. (laughs) The week before Thanksgiving break is like an ice melt (laughs) on Despondent's campus. We have classes here until Wednesday before Thanksgiving, of course, but some students seem to think that it's a full week holiday, no doubt facilitated by a surprising number of faculty who themselves cancel classes during the week. Not me, however. I'm here to the bitter end. But without students, the campus feels like a tree that has lost its bloom. Though the quad is quiet, it's not completely without a pulse. There are signs of life. Many of our students, for one reason or another, simply can't go home for the holiday. Some have athletic team commitments, others have jobs on campus, a handful can't afford the time not to work on papers, and for many, especially our international students, home is just too far away. So one of my traditions during the Thanksgiving holiday is to invite some of these students over for a big feast at my table. I like to make one of Oma's famous mashed potato recipes with the steamed carrots, the green beans, and the succulent oven-roasted turkey with a stuffing cooked inside. It's awesome. I've never had a complaint. I always look forward to this feast with students. To be honest, I don't know if I know of any activity I enjoy more than time with good friends around the table. Time that is unhurried and unscripted is a gift. Time to sit and feel one's ease before a spread of creation's abundance is a sure sign and visible, tangible result of God's providential care in our life. I love sitting with friends who, take, who, like, who like to banter about with wit and wisdom. I love the inevitable storytelling that takes place between four fills of green beans. I love the jokes that catch me mid-swallow that make the milk squirt out of my nose. I love overhearing the side conversations spoken in low, hushed voices. There is just something about having a people over and eating at a table. It is a way of disarming, it has a way of disarming us, doesn't it? I have found it the best way to talk to students with their guard down. It's amazing the kind of dirt I pick up on Despondent's campus with a tablecloth, a potato, and a cooked bird. One of the observations I want to ask my students who are coming over for the break is, from my perspective, some rather odd and disturbing new communication patterns on campus. I'm not just talking about the guy who walks past you blindly while he's texting his mom what he had for lunch. No, I'm noticing some other more telltale signs that we may be heading into or have arrived at a new kind of cultural moment. I'm noticing that we are losing the ability to communicate well. The irony is that as we gain more devices that promise to facilitate communication, we forget how to do it. 
Tools are only helpful in the hands of somebody who knows what they're doing. Now, granted, I'm a little old school and a little slow on the uptake when it comes to technology, but I'm no Luddite. I have a cell phone. I know how to text. I'm on the internet. I've got 1,020 friends on Facebook. I'm in the game. But what I'm learning seems to be challenging the assumption that technology, the, the technological progress means human progress. In fact, I think some of the evolution in our technology may be creating the context for our de-evolution as a people. Take, for example, a story I heard the other day as an antidote of proof. Two roommates having it out with one another via Facebook chat. The disturbing part was not that the roommates had an argument or exchanged sharp words with each other via the internet. All that is perfectly understandable. What was disturbing is that they had this fight via Facebook while they were in the same room. <laughs> what we have here, says a movie long ago, is a failure to communicate. We are creating a culture where we don't have to, where we don't have to do the difficult work of talking to each other face to face. Do you know that one reputable estimate is that 74%, 74% of singles now look for a mate by turning to sites like eHarmony, Match.com, and OkCupid, which use algorithms to pair people up based upon answers to a set of questions. Men don't have to learn how to get up the nerve to talk to a woman anymore. They just have to punch in their stats. Another example of this de-evolution of communication patterns I've noticed on Despondence Campus is an online interactive site called Like a Little. <laughs> Do you know about this? From what I gather, Like a Little is a site where students comment anonymously on other students. It's supposedly, it's supposedly a safe place to flirt and make comments without any personal risk. But isn't the point of flirting to have some hope that the other person knows you're doing it? <laughs> Brunette, male, I saw you walking last night under the full moon. It feels like a scene from Twilight. <laughs> Blonde, female, in my philosophy class with Professor Yates, your challenge to the epistemological assumptions of the Kantian critique of pure reason gave me the goosebumps of pure religious affection. Ooh. <laughs> Doesn't this seem silly to anyone else? It all feels like, hold on, hold on. It all feels like a communicative voyeurism, a degeneration back to middle school. Doesn't anyone remember that middle school sucked? <laughs> like a little should be renamed, I like you enough to talk to you facelessly online, but not enough to talk to you in person. <laughs> Come on, boys, man up and talk to the girl. Yeah. Yeah. Can I get an amen? Now, what causes me to pause and wonder, however, is whether or not sites like, uh, like a little and the, and their viral, viral popularity is just another of the signs pointing out that we are in a cultural tipping point. What does like a little mean from here on out? Can we expect communication with no consequences? What does all this mean for dating and relationships? Is the consequence that little Trigview will grow up in a world without face-to-face -face communication? and conversation. Whether you, are e whether you are entering into a friendship or falling in love, open-ended, seemingly unimportant conversations are essential to building intimacy required for authentic relationships. That is what the table, time together, eating food affords us and why it is so enjoyable. I wonder about even these letters we write. Are we the last generation to know the joys of getting a letter in the mail? Is the age of a letter dead? If it is, I will be terribly sad. For letters are one of the great joys of life. Texts, email, Skype, Facebook, none of these can replace the sentence that is won in the quiet of the heart and put into expression with a pen. Few things are in fact as pleasurable and fertile to growing the soul as engaging in good conversation, whether it's through words spoken or written. So let us covenant not to give up on the power of language. Let us not surrender the letter or the verse. Let us not sacrifice communication that requires the personal touch because we devise ways to make it more easy. I wonder what the new communication habits learned on campus will mean for table talk at this year's Thanksgiving dinner. Will we lose the ability for witty banter and the volley of parlor room wit? Will we forget how to tell our stories? I fear it might. I was reading in a recent Psychology Today article that one of the endangered arts of our late modern moment 
is that we are losing the ability to cultivate the art of meaningful conversation. Think of it. If the table is nothing else, it is the space set aside to practice the art of conversation. It is here where we give and take at the table, where we learn via other people how the world works. Talking at the table is not only a joy, it also forces us to clarify our perspectives as, we, as well as recall our experiences. It requires the capacity to listen meaningfully to another. A meandering meal can unlock the doors to memories long ago stored away. What will the family table be like without the ability to tell the stories, to rehearse the narrative that defines who we are? I think we will lose something sacred in this next season, and in this loss, the prelude to a dark chapter where instead of dining on crafted words and stories, we binge on the empty calories of texting at the table. When I start to feel this way, it's important for me to listen to Scripture again. Scripture, more than anything I know, has the power to reframe my perspective. As you know, uh, we at Despondent U, along with you at Hope and with Calvin, have been working through Philippians this year. And one of my favorite verses in this little uh, letter that Paul wrote is in chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Paul writes this, Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. I imagine that one of the things the Christians in Philippi learned and received from Paul was the art of conversation. He says, think on what is pure and good and commendable. We can speak only what we think about, what we meditate on. So it's so easy to give voice to what is negative. It's harder to offer pure and generous words to each other. I can't help but imagine Paul sitting at a Thanksgiving table of his own, enjoying his ease with friends. I imagine Paul laughing at their jokes, sharing stories of his many travels, giving testimony to his many adventures. Did I ever tell you about that time, he says, when I was shipwrecked on Cyprus? I imagine at some point in the evening, Paul would begin to tell another story of a God who came into flesh and lived among us, a God who revealed himself as a revelation to him along the side of a lonely road. I imagine when he spoke of Jesus the Christ, the risen Messiah, there was a joy and awe in his voice, a reverence that ignited the light of humanity for all who listened. For Christ is he who is most honorable and excellent and praiseworthy, and to think on him, to speak of his life, his cross, the moment and work of our reconciliation with God, to dwell and give voice to the power and mystery of his resurrection, the promise of our hope, is to begin to reclaim the art of divine discourse. For Christ is God's word, and it is this word that prepares the family table for a feast that has no end. For it is God's word, Jesus Christ, that is both the source and the host of redemption's feast. It is Christ who gives the family table not only its storied coherence, but also its shared joy. It is the story of Christ's redemption I want to remember this Thanksgiving with my students who come over to my house. For the crucified and resurrected Christ is our redemption that redefines our notion of home. The good news is, when we remember, when we think deeply on Christ, is that he is right now inviting, preparing, and hosting a family table of his own, a feast of grace for all who come to him in faith. This grace is a reality whether those who come to my house think it true or not. One can deny the sun, ignore the light, but the ignorance does not disqualify the reality that the sun burns bright. I like to think on this as I prepare my meal on Thursday, for it is all prelude. And when we sit at the table with wit and banter, with jokes and gossip, I can't wait to share the story of Christ in my life. For even if some students can't get home, in thinking and dwelling with Christ, we are always welcome at the family table. Through faith in Christ, we are always at home. Have a happy Thanksgiving, my friend. 
Greet Kristen and little Trigvi and, of course, your beloved dog, Whidbey. That's all the news from Despondent U where the campus is quiet, but the grace is large. Grace and peace, Karis. My friends, as you head into Thanksgiving break, whether you go north or south, whether you go east or west, may you go so knowing that in Christ you are always at home and in Christ you always have a family table that you can dine at. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen.